Holy shit. Welcome back, Whistle Stop. Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, we have missed you so much. Ah. <laughs> Uh, in case anybody doesn't know, my name is Jennifer Corley. I am program director for So Say We All, and this is Justin Hudnell, executive director of So Say We All. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming out for our first live, in-person, vamp storytelling showcase in 16 months. <laughs> So uh, who is ready to kick off their feral girl summer with us? <laughs> uh, who's ready to celebrate those quarantine 15? <laughs> Who is ready to uh, grow out those curtain bangs you gave yourself? <laughs> I myself uh, met my COVID hair goal of Cheryl Blossom from Archie Comics. <laughs> Thank you. It's an old reference. Um, so we firstly want to thank the Whistle Stop Bar for not only surviving the pandemic when San Diego has lost so many <laughs> venues, but also for having us back on their stage as soon as it was deemed safe. Tonight's vamp is Whistle Stop's first live show since the quarantine uh, ended, and we could not be more honored. So thank you, Whistle Stop. And we also want to point out how Whistle Stop hasn't wasted the time while their doors were shuttered, because we know that manager extraordinaire Drew and owner Sam have been using the time to renovate the hell out of this place with new taps, new equipment, but my most favorite, an actual working model train whose whistle they are going to use when it's time to get the hell out of here. <laughs> and the bar has not lost its soul one bit. This is still a place for artists to take risks, and we absolutely love them for that. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Not only do we love Whistle Stop, we love all of you. Thank you so much for sticking with us through all of this time. We have survived and thrived all of this because of you and Drag Race Thailand. Yes. Never don't thank Drag Race Thailand for getting us through the pandemic. They're just so fucking nice to each other. Americans have so much to learn. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, I just want to uh, say the last time we had a live audience was here in February of uh, last year. And um, in case I ever run for mayor and the tape surfaces and ruins my career, I just want to confess something to you right now. Uh, the last time I was on the stage uh, and opening the show, I made a, made a little joke or two about this silly little virus everybody was freaking out about in front of a crowd of 210 people. <laughs> and then like a week later, everything burned down to the ground and Drew immediately got COVID. So I'm not saying that's mine, but I think you should name it after me. Uh, I want you to all know though that I did do the responsible thing after I realized my mistake, which was to immediately pull a 180 on social media and just start bowling anti-maskers through virtue signaling into trying to kill themselves. Because the best part of being an American is being immune to hypocrisy, and I'm glad I could uphold our country's traditions in the face of all threats. You're welcome. So uh, during the 15 months that followed, we at So Say We All transitioned all of our programming online for those of you who were following us. We threw ourselves into learning all about what the kids were into. And honestly, we kind of wish we hadn't sometimes, to be honest. Um, we learned a lot about Twitch, about subcultures like Hot Tub Girls. We fielded some helpful suggestions from well-meaning friends about how we should do silly dances to encourage donations, which I decided I'd rather suck start a shotgun than be caught doing. 
honestly, because I'm 40 and I have to look at myself in the mirror, and that's hard enough every day. But we never missed one show, even though things got weird, as you can see from some of the pics behind us. My favorite thing about the time lapse is that you can kind of see me graduating waist sizes of pants until I method act Santa Claus way too fucking well. Now, I know that there was a lot of ugly, or we all saw our society show its ass about, and that we witnessed in our time apart, but I want you to take this away from me, that the good and people that we wanted to see rising out of a crisis really did show up. Um, we never missed a month without people wanting to tell their stories. Our audience was always there to support them online. Our VAMP people, our community college students who were able to have like a full semester through the hardship of Zoom with our incredible community college partners. And uh, you guys were there to uh, cheer them on when the only audience they had to talk to was a camera and all of the awkwardness of that. Um, but you understood how hard that was. You wanted to give them a semblance of a community. You wanted to keep us alive. Uh, your donations have allowed this organization to thrive when a lot of people did not. And so for that, I just wanted to say we are so proud to call you our community. And thank you. It's good to be back. I'm even wearing huge heels to try. <laughs> I thought maybe it would prevent this mic thing, but no. Uh, so I am so happy to be able to do this. Uh, we always love to talk about how So Say We All is a community. It has never felt more true than right now. The performers, the volunteers, the board members, and the audience. Uh, we, we've always felt that our shows help people feel a little less crazy and a little less alone. And we have been so glad that we were able to keep that going online during COVID. But we are so fucking happy to be able to get back to a ritual that we treasure and that we maybe even took for granted. So won't everybody in the crowd Please turn to someone nearby that you don't know and introduce yourself. <laughs> Say hi. Ask if they got Pfizer or Moderna. Tell them how gorgeous they look. Okay. One, two, One, two three, three, eyes on, on me! Us. <laughs> okay, thank you for doing that. Didn't that feel good to talk to someone other than your cat? Okay, so next up, uh, I just want to introduce our producer for this month, who has been a wonderful part of our So Say We All community. Uh, she's been with us through all of COVID. Uh, I believe this is her fourth time producing. Uh, she also performed at the last live show that we had here. And so now she's here again. So she's um, responsible for all of this in a way. Um, <laughs> and, and she is here to help welcome us all back with this new batch of storytellers. So please welcome Victoria Leva. Oh my God, I'm a fucking giant right now. Okay, let's get this. It is so nice to see you all. Seriously, it's so wonderful to see your faces. I missed you, I missed you. Not so much, no, just kidding. I'm not wearing my glasses, so I don't know what any of you look like, but it is nice to see your shadows. Okay, I just wanna talk really quick about how I got involved. I first came to the VAMP show a couple years ago and was told that everybody has a story to tell. So I decided to go home and write something and eventually began to perform. It does help if you're like me, though, and if you've done shit like date a cult member, date a racist, suck and fuck your way across dating apps, and let's see what else, get a shitty lip tattoo, that's not going away for the rest of your life. <laughs> so like Jennifer said, this is my fourth time producing, I've coached several times, and this is my Fifth, no, I've performed five times. I wish I was performing again tonight, to be honest with you. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> but
But I just want to let you guys know that everyone has a story to tell. And I know we all hear it all the time, but it's really true. And I would love to see any of you come up here and learn more about you and your life and how amazing things are. And I think we all kind of need that right now, right? Just to get a little closer together. Um, well, it means a lot to be back, uh, especially after being apart for like 39 months. Um, but I don't want to think too, too much about that, so I'm just excited to be with you and see our community coming back together, seeing these stories, and being stronger than ever together. But before I get, like, really sentimental and, like, kind of drone on, I just want to say a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you didn't get a chance to donate at the door, please, please donate. We would really appreciate it. If you donate five bucks or even more, you might get a sensual back massage from myself or never run out my boyfriend. We wouldn't like that. But from the board members, we have a plethora to choose from. Um, please be quiet during the show. These performers are kind of nervous. We want to give them the best audience possible. So let's do our best to be quiet. Literally, that's not too hard to do, I hope. Um, when a mystery person hands you a glass, uh, take that glass and pass it back. We're trying to get them back to the bar. Uh, don't worry about cooties. We're over that, right? Um, so anyways. Oh, phone on vibrate. Please check your phones and do not have them loud. Someone will come and beat you with a stick if you have your phone on loud. Anyways, let's get this fucking show started, shall we? I need to read the performers, actually. Hold on a second. Okay, so first, we're going to start off with Savannah Cannon, but we also have Arthur Somm, Rachel Medlock, Rachel Holt, Adam Greenfield, and Janelle Drumright. Savannah Cannon, come on up. There is a store in New York City whose hallowed halls are graced by thousands of nervous brides-to-be. Every inch of the walls in the brightly lit showroom are filled with glittery, slinky, lacy wedding gowns of every cut and possible shade of white. Pearl, cream, daisy, porcelain, cotton, and other hues named after items as fragile as the soon-to-be-delivered wedding bells. <laughs> Sleek black couches sit upon fluffy white carpet, encircling bridal risers that elevate the lucky women high above everyone else in the showroom, physically and metaphorically. This is Kleinfeld. Featured on TLC's Say Yes to the Dress, it takes months to reserve an appointment to be fawned over by dress consultants who are skilled in every compliment to ensure they earn a 10% commission on a $35,000 dress. I had a friend who was engaged to be married. Her name was Gwen. Her chosen bridesmaids lived scattered across the country, so it only made sense to meet up in New York City to go wedding dress shopping at this store. Yes, an entire weekend trip and $680 on American Airlines for the simple act of picking out a one-hour outfit at a store where we would not be on TLC. Fortunately, the bachelorette party would be in Chicago, and the wedding would be in Colorado Springs, so the entire multiple month affair would only cost about 5000 per bridesmaid. I should have become a wedding dress consultant. I met the bride in Japan in 2013. The military dropped us on an island where Americans flocked together and formed family ties to make up for the families they left behind. I was newly out of the Marine Corps and Gwen was a glamorously tall and beautifully blonde officer in the Air Force who my boyfriend wanted to fuck. <laughs> she was everything I wanted to be, world-traveled, educated, and a really fast runner. Clearly, we needed to become friends. Now, years and a few international moves later, I found myself on the hook as Gwen's maid of honor. I hadn't seen her since the time she came to San Diego, and I ended up getting roofied at the Gossip Grill. <laughs> to be honest... I wasn't surprised, I was surprised to be invited to her wedding, much less as the maid of honor. We weren't that close, and I certainly never confided in her, so why was I chosen? I showed up in New York City, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed for this $16,000 shopping trip. I was pumped. I had never been to the Big Apple, so I flew in a day early, because it was cheaper, and I needed a day to steal myself for what was sure to come. Gwen and I had a history full of bonfires, naked swimming in the China Sea with our bladder of wine, and emotional blowouts that made me feel like I was reliving my childhood. I walked 10 miles in New York City seeing everything on my list. 
I had to make sure the rest of the weekend was open to whatever Gwen wanted to do, and I wasn't going to squander my chances to be held by a strange lady as I stopped at the 9-11 museum. It was great. I wasn't even remotely nervous to be soon surrounded by a bunch of women I didn't know while doing one of my least favorite pastimes, clothes shopping. I met up with Gwen and her childhood best friend Stephanie, Gwen's mom, the soon-to-be mother of the bride, and a few other women. We had dinner, saw Avenue Q on Broadway, and the old folks went to bed while us young women took on the city. After the first bar, I puked and rallied, opting to stay... <laughs> Opting to stay sober for the rest of the night, because contrary to popular belief, not all Marines can outdrink at a fish. The four of us picked up some stragglers at a bar where all the Broadway understudies hung out and sang at each other a la High School Musical and headed to the infamous Stonewall Inn. The significance of this bar choice by the straight bride was not lost on me. Gwen had been so angry at me for choosing to sleep with another girlfriend of mine the year prior, and I was astonished that a straight girl I hadn't seen in years who lived in another state was angry at me for not choosing to come on to her. <laughs> By erasure is real, y'all. <laughs> I don't like to sleep with my girlfriends anymore, and I certainly... <laughs> I certainly didn't like sleeping with ones who get furious at me when I say no thank you. But you slept with her and not me? Why not me? Was something that came up angrily every single time Gwen drank around me. See, my friend the bride is an alcoholic. And I'm not talking about the kind and flirty drunk who everyone in the friend group fucks at least once before finding actual fulfillment with depth and connection. <laughs> I'm talking angry drunk, mean drunk, the drunk bound and determined to ruin everyone's night four times over through cruel words or destruction of property and spirit. So I knew how the night was going to go. Drunks are boring like that. In Stonewall Inn at three in the morning, the rest of the bridesmaids and myself, well past our bedtimes and tired, sat down and waited for Gwen to wear herself out. All of us sighed, sitting in exhausted silence until one of the bridesmaids spoke up. Did you hear? She doesn't even love him. Shouldn't we say something, I said? Like what? I don't know. Encourage her not to spend how much to marry someone she doesn't even love? $120,000, someone else reminded us. Isn't this our job, to tell her she shouldn't do it? Just then, Gwen, who had been playing pool with a bunch of annoying army guys, fell over a stool. She was yelling, well, fuck you too, you weak-ass bitch, to one of the soldiers who had sidled up to her and was doing the predatory lean-in men tend to do when they eye the weak one of the herd. <laughs> I hopped to my feet and cut between them, brightly telling Gwen it was time to go. The man wasn't going to let her go so easily, though. He motioned his friend over to distract me. I kept stepping between them and Gwen. Deftly removing myself from their presence with some bullshit southern charm. Us girls need our beauty sleep for the big day tomorrow. Now y'all go on and get. <laughs> I leave with the group. Once we are outside of Stonewall, Gwen launched at me. You fucking cock blocked me. <laughs> I didn't realize you wanted to get laid tonight, especially by someone in the army. Just give me a heads up next time and you can have at him. You just hate when someone else gets attention. I ignored her as I hailed an Uber for our 10-minute ride to our hotel. She continued to spit venom at me, how I get all the attention and she gets none, and no one will ever hit on her once she is married. As I stepped out of the Uber, I muttered, isn't that kind of the point? <laughs> it was 5.30 in the morning and my drunk friend was screaming at me in the streets of New York City. I started to laugh. I couldn't help it. It was just such a New York moment, and I was thrilled to be there. But we had to wake up in two hours to make it to the Kleinfeld appointment. I asked Stephanie if she had everything under control, and she assured me she would try to calm Gwen down and get her into the hotel room. She gave me a look and assured me, I have plenty of practice with her like this. We have been friends for 20 years. I took a shower, got ready for an hour of sleep, and collected Gwen, who was now blackout drunk and screaming, and put her in bed cajoling her with a calming voice and a gentle hand before guiding, for, before crawling into bed with Stephanie. We looked at each other inside, wordlessly agreeing to the absolute ridiculousness of the whole night. Then we reached out and held hands. We started to fall asleep. 
With a jolt, Gwen jumped out of the bed next to us and glared at us. She snatched one of my hands, got back into her bed, and proceeded to hold my hand across the aisle like some sleep-deprived Stretch Armstrong doll. I glared at the ceiling before dozing off. After 45 minutes of delicious sleep, I grabbed some breakfast and brought some toast back to the room for the bride. Everyone else could fend for themselves. I woke Gwen up, and she groggily accepted me dressing her. While everyone stumbled around the room getting their stuff together, how on earth do women's <laughs> possessions expand exponentially when they travel? I called an Uber. I dutifully gathered Gwen's wedding shoes and portfolio of similar styles she wanted and loaded her into the car with the rest of the party. Throughout the drive to the store, Gwen made cunning remarks about my sluttiness, how she was surprised I didn't go home with the army dude since I totally wanted him, and everyone awkwardly ignored her. The Uber driver caught my eye, and I flushed. Into Kleinfeld we went, which was so bright and sparkly that even my not hungover ass felt sick. The showroom was filled with women dressed to the nines, with their friends and family ooing and aahing over whatever nonsensical dress the bride-to-be was squeezed into. We walked past signs saying that filming would not take place today, but if we were filmed, we should be okay with it, and sit in the back of the showroom on two of the couches surrounding a bridal riser. Gwen began the charade of trying on dress after dress, and we all dutifully handed out our oohs and ahs. I was ever tentative with arranging her dresses, not commenting on anything negative, leaving the fat arm comments to her mom, <laughs> and generally counting down until I could leave this shit show. We were down to a second time dress which Gwen looked gorgeous in. I, <laughs> I bet my ex-boyfriend would have creamed himself. <laughs> I leaned over to the dress consultant and whispered, are you going to ask, do you say yes to the dress? Gwen was horrified and a tad bit angry I hadn't seen any of the 282 episodes of reality TV garbage. I had scrambled to watch an episode clip on YouTube during the walk from our restaurant to the Broadway theater. I wanted to be informed be a good maid of honor, not an out-of-touch old crone. So I got the gist. 282 fucking episodes? Are you kidding me? And strove to make this the bridal experience my tall and beautifully blonde friend wanted. The dress consultant leaned in next to me and whispered back, yes, we can usually tell when they're settling on a dress, and then we'll ask. Oh, good. That's really important to her. <laughs> Gwen spun around and chucked the fake bouquet directly into my face. You don't fucking ask them that. The dress consultant jumped back with a yelp and immediately recomposed her face in strict professionalism as she bent down to get the bouquet. I remained standing in stunned silence for the rest of the dress trip. She said yes to the dress for a cool $12,000 while I moseyed over to the tiara section and tried on crowns as shiny as the tears in my eyes. The others pulled me aside and asked if I was okay. I was. And if I was going to do anything, what was there to do? Advise Gwen not to conduct the bouquet toss at the wedding because my teeth had already cleaned the prize? <laughs> I sat far away from her at brunch while she proceeded to bloat up on Bloody Mary's. Stephanie caught me on the way to the bathroom. Look, I want you to know I don't agree with her, but she's asking when you're going to apologize. I was shook. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Apologize? For fucking what? I stomped away, got my luggage, and gla grabbed an Uber out of there. It took me weeks to decide if I wanted to go through with my duties as the maid of honor. I needed to know why this person I chose to worship decided to choose me. <laughs> Months after the New York trip, I had my answer. It was at her bachelorette party in Chicago, where more women attended, traveling thousands of miles, and again spending thousands of dollars just to celebrate her. And to no one's surprise, she was horribly cruel. And when the emotional turmoil she drank to escape bubbled over, causing her to scream and cry and have a panic attack so bad that she couldn't breathe, every single other woman refused to go to her. But me? After the insults, the bouquet, the cruelty over the years, I went and I held her while her elitist facade broke, and she told me about her father dying, how she was raped multiple times, how she was terrified of getting help because of her career, and I cradled Gwen in my arms as she sobbed, breathing with her, and being someone who could withstand the storm. Because while some storms destroy, my life ensured I was used to it, and I knew that people weren't just shitty out of nowhere. After all the horrible stuff she had endured over the years, Gwen wanted the perfect day, 
with the perfect dress and the perfect experience to ensure others saw her how I saw her in Kleinfeld. Beautiful, poised, surrounded by those who loved her. But you know what? At her wedding, after all that, she didn't even wear the dress. Guess what, everybody? That's a vamp first timer, Savannah Cannon. When it's time to take her shirt off, you do not, as you might imagine, start undoing the buttons. Neither do you raise her arms and lift the shirt over her head. No, the first thing you do is grab one of her arms and give it a sharp upward tug. If you do it right, and it takes practice, the arm comes off fairly easily. Then you slide the detached arm down through the sleeve, put it carefully on the floor, and do the same to the other arm. Once you remove the wig, you can lift the shirt off with no problem at all. I was 10 years old when I learned how to dress and undress mannequins. My parents owned a women's clothing store in Oceanside. The business eventually expanded into a chain of four stores in northern San Diego and southern Orange counties. I had to spend every second Saturday helping out, emptying wastebaskets, putting clothes left in the fitting rooms back on the proper racks, polishing mirrors, cleaning ashtrays. I'd also open boxes of merchandise from suppliers and put the clothes on hangers and enter their code numbers into the line, what we called the line book in pencil, which was how inventory was tracked before computers. I also had to, and this is where my nightmare took root, I had to trim windows, that is, change the clothes on display. Now, you may think, well, what's so bad about that? I'll tell you what's so bad about that. A 10-year-old boy in the early 1960s handling women's clothes, standing in a display window, surrounded by naked and semi-naked women. OK, mannequins. They were just mannequins. But, but still, if anyone from school were to walk by, see, nightmare stuff. <laughs> And I was already having a rough time in school. We'd just moved to Carlsbad from southern Indiana. And on my first day, two events cast me out of the mainstream. First, in an attempt to show everyone I wasn't dumb, I answered a question in class. The answer was Washington. I said, Washington. The class exploded. I haven't said it that way since. Washington, right? It's Washington. Then at recess, four boys cornered me. Me, the new kid from Nowheresville, Indiana. They asked if I knew what the Bonsai Pipeline was. I said, no. And that was pretty much it for me in the fifth grade. <laughs> so, to be so to be spotted in the display window of a women's clothing store was unthinkable. It simply couldn't happen. My parents and I would arrive at the store before the large shopping center opened. Now, this was before malls. Shopping centers in those days were long strips of stores, usually anchored by a grocery store on one end and a drugstore on the other, with specialty stores like ours in between. Our neighbors on either side, for example, were a Singer sewing center and a jewelry store. I'd always beg my mother first to get started changing the display right away because I wanted to minimize my chances of being seen. But even if she agreed, it, it'd take us a while. And before we were finished, people had started walking by. Fortunately, I had a plan B. Built into the wall, backing the window display, was a hidden door that swung open when it was pushed. Behind it was a small dark room where we kept spare mannequins, spare mannequin parts, spare mannequin wigs, rolls of carpet, extra shelving, stuff like that. Whenever I sensed or saw someone approaching, I'd slip into the room and hide till they passed. My mother would say, come out here and stop fooling around. I never explained to her why I kept doing that. Working in a women's clothing store as a prepubescent boy had some unintended consequences. 
the most severe came from my dealing with, shall we say, undergarments. <laughs> Intimate female apparel. <laughs> or we could just say nylons, bras, and panties. At the back of the store, in the receiving room, I'd open a box from a supplier. And inside would be, say, six dozen panties of various sizes, styles, and colors. I'd enter them into the line book, stick price tags on them, and put them on the floor. That is to say, out front, for sale. Now, this very early, very hands-on acquaintance with intimate female apparel utterly desensitized me to its intended erotic effect. <laughs> to this day, such items as push-up bras, garters, black lacy anything, have the same effect on me as a display of coffee mugs in Macy's housewares section. <laughs> if you ever catch me peering into the window of, of a Victoria's Secret, what's going through my mind is probably something like, I bet that thong was hard to get on, right? <laughs> and they're getting $19 for those panties, really? <laughs> Another unintended consequence of my having worked in the store was a disastrous attempt for the first time to put a serious move on a girl. Calculating that the moment was right, I grabbed her arm and tugged up sharply. <laughs> to, my, to my surprise, the arm didn't come off. She said, what are you doing? Okay, that didn't actually happen. <laughs> One cool thing did happen later, though. When I was a teenager, when a mannequin got faded or badly chipped, we'd bring it home and keep it in the garage until we could sell it secondhand. At any given time, there might be three or four of them in there, without clothes, of course. When a new friend would come over, I'd say, hey, you want to play some ping pong? He'd say, sure. I'd lead him to the garage, open the side door, and say, Go on in, I'll get the light. He'd take a couple of steps into the dark. I'd flip the switch and he'd go, ha, ah, ah. ha! <laughs> Worked every single time. <laughs> but all in all, I hated, just hated working in this store. Later, this would lead to serious conflict with my parents, who dreamed that I would someday take over the, bu take over the business ideally with one or both of my siblings. But I was adamant. I wanted no part of it. In retrospect, I can understand their desire. They came out of the Depression. They built this successful business. We were solidly upper middle class. And it was sitting, just sitting there, waiting for me. They'd say, how do you know you don't like running a business when you haven't even tried it? I'd say, I just know. It wasn't much of an answer, but there it was. I just knew. In addition to my fear of window trimming, I disliked working in the store for two other reasons. First, there simply wasn't enough for me to do. And a lot of the time, I was underfoot, in the way, just standing around. It was awful. If you've ever been stuck in a job like that, even as an adult, I mean, before video games and online pornography. <laughs> You'll know what I'm talking about. Second, and maybe more important, I was intensely aware of being the boss's kid. All the employees were nice to cute little me, and maybe that was in part because they actually were just nice. But some of it had to come from my being the boss's kid. That was my identity. I was stuck with it. I had to wear it and I found the fit profoundly uncomfortable. I coped as best I could, and then I found a way to cope even better. One afternoon, I had to go into the hidden room behind the window display to fetch something. There was no emergency, no one was waiting for me, so I decided to just hang out for a while. It wasn't as if I was gonna be missed. The window displays required strong lighting, so it was warm in that small, crowded space. I sat on a scrap of carpet. After a few minutes, I realized that if I curled up tightly, there was room for me to lie down. The scratchiness of the carpet 
and is oddly soothing. The side wall separating the room from the rest of the store didn't go all the way to the ceiling, so I had to be very quiet, very still. I could also hear everything. This was before the days of stores pumping out skull-shattering music. There was only the chatter of salesgirls and customers, the clacking of plastic hangers, the occasional ding of the cash drawer. The room seemed to grow warmer. Sounds coalesced into a vague buzz. My head rested on a mannequin torso. Above me loomed those fragile female figures, some complete, others missing, missing whatever. It didn't matter. They were familiar, comforting, welcoming me, enveloping me, womb-like. My mouth opened slightly. I felt drool drip to the carpet. The buzzing faded away, and there was only warmth, then more warmth, then more warmth, then oblivion. For a while, at least, I had escaped. So as much as I disliked working with mannequins in public, I was fine with them person to person. <laughs> oh, boy to faux female figure. By the late 70s and early 80s, even though I had not gone into the family business, I noticed that mannequins had begun to disappear. Ultra-hip window, window trimming designers were displaying clothes by, say, running a cable through the arms of shirts and dresses and letting them just hang in the air and clipping skirts and pants to the cable. The few mannequins that remained were transformed, made less human-like, their natural-looking surfaces replaced by shiny metal or wire mesh with facial features barely hinted at. I surprised myself by kind of missing them. Walking through a mall and seeing the no mannequin look in the window, in window after window, made me a little sad, resentful even. But time passed as it does, and fashion changed again as it does, and how about that, mannequins returned. And I'm glad to see them. After all these decades, no trace remains of my little boy anxiety. When I pass by a display window, I sometimes nod to one of my old friends, give her a small secret smile. We go way back. That is Vamp veteran, Mr. Arthur Salm. Let's start with the gown I woke up in. I was in a paper gown when they wheeled me back into the OR, along with cute little hospital-issued purple fleece socks with a white bear on them. I don't remember anyone changing me from the paper gown into the cloth one, but then again, I had a hard time coming out of anesthesia, so mainly all I remember is a cacophony of voices and beeping and bright lights and almost throwing up on myself. 20 cc's, the nurse declared of my vomit, which at the last moment I had managed to aim into a little green plastic bag, like a dog poop bag. You're not waking up very well, she said, but all you need to remember is that you're cancer free and you still have your ovaries. Okay, can you hold on to that? You're cancer free. I still have my ovaries, I repeated groggily. You still have your ovaries. I managed a smile. Who cared about the gown and my upset stomach? I still had ovaries and purple fleece bear socks, and that was what mattered. So much of our femininity and our womanhood is tied up with our fertility, even if you never plan to have children, a few kind and well-meaning women told me before my hysterectomy. The doctors warn you about the physical pain, but they leave out the psychological pain, the way you don't feel like a complete woman anymore. I didn't mean to get angry at these women for telling me this, I didn't mean to get angry at Google a few days after surgery when I looked up depression after hysterectomy and the top result agreed 
that a woman's identity is anchored in her womb. But I was angry. Whose womanhood? Whose femininity? I wanted to ask them. Have you looked at me lately? <laughs> Do you honestly think my sense of womanhood parallels yours? Without knowing it, my well-meaning friends were telling me that the exclusive club I'd been trying to gain entrance to my entire life, the club of womanhood, of femaleness, would now permanently lock its doors to me because of a missing uterus? My uterus had nothing to do with it. Let's move from the hospital back to preschool. There was a fair of some kind, and there were pony rides, and I was riding on one such pony like a proper cowboy when I heard a mother say to her impatient son, you can go as soon as this little boy finishes. I turned around, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl. The mother looked at me like she didn't believe me. <laughs> she didn't say a word, no apology, just stared. My preschool self was offended. How dare this lady? And yet, I suppose I really shouldn't have been offended. After all, preschool was about the same time that my mom had asked me to stop telling anyone who would listen that I wanted to be a boy. In second grade, several teachers and school administrators decided I was intellectually disabled, emotionally disturbed, and sexually confused. My tomboy tendencies, they said, indicated a deeper psychological disorder, and I was in need of serious counseling. Thank God my parents disagreed and fought for me. In third grade, I made a friend named Julie, who was as tomboy as I was. In our after-school program, we sat in a back corner of the room and traded baseball cards. <laughs> but we attracted unwanted attention from a pack of mean girls who couldn't handle the thought of sharing the after-school program with two baby dykes. <laughs> One day, I went to our back corner to find Julie curled into a fetal position while the girls took turns kicking her. I ran to find a teacher, but the mean girls denied everything, and the teacher didn't believe me. In that moment, it finally dawned on me that adults, who were supposed to be fair and protective, often had just as much of a problem with how I dressed and kept my hair as the bullies who teased me did. At the end of fifth grade, my mom told me she wanted me to grow my hair out because if I didn't, people were going to think I was a queer. What's a queer? I asked. She hesitated. It means strange. But people already think I'm strange, I argued. <laughs> I grew my hair out anyway. Even long hair didn't help. In eighth grade, I moved to Georgia and decided I would have a fresh start. I'd make an effort to fit in with the other girls for once in my life. I pierced my ears. I chose clothes in the girls' department. I curled my bangs. And yet, the first week of school, while waiting to be led into math class, I found myself surrounded by the football boys. One of them inspected me up and down, screwed his face up in a look of mock confusion, and asked loudly, you're a girl? The other boys laughed uproariously, and even I managed the nervous chuckle of a cornered rodent. Fuck this. <laughs> I thought. And so I reached the beginning of the end of my attempts to fit in with the other girls. Speaking of fucking. <laughs> Let's fast forward to age 22, the
the last time in my life I ever wore a dress or a skirt. I was fully out and living with my girlfriend at the time. But despite giving lip service to at last being comfortable with who I really was, I still carried the weight of being told all my life that a woman was supposed to be some other way. Deep down, I agreed. I believed that although I could dress like myself most of the time, I still had to wear traditionally feminine garb for weddings, funerals, and other formal occasions. At first, when I came home from a funeral in a skirt and started messing around with my girlfriend, there was something thrillingly sexy about it, in a gender-bending kind of way. <laughs> I was the more masculine of the two of us, so wearing a skirt to bed felt like kinky role play. <laughs> the thrill ended when I burst into tears halfway through, and my poor, confused girlfriend, unable to draw a coherent explanation from me, stomped out of our bedroom in frustration. I showered once she left, suddenly feeling inexplicably dirty. As the hot water washed away my tears, I realized I couldn't do it anymore. I was never going to be the kind of woman everyone else seemed to want me to be, and I was so very, very tired of trying. I turned off the shower and stopped crying. I made a promise to myself that I would never again wear a dress or a skirt, not for weddings or funerals or job interviews or mothers or even girlfriends. I could walk you through a montage of my adult experiences of being misgendered, stared at, excluded, chased out of women's restrooms and women's locker rooms, but I'll skip all that and move ahead to the first time someone asked me which pronouns I preferred. I was so stunned by the question that all I could do was stare in response, and it was my girlfriend Lizzie who filled the awkward silence on my behalf. She, her, Lizzie supplied. You can say she, her. Later, Lizzie explained that the woman who'd asked for my pronouns was merely being polite and respectful. Everyone asks about preferred pronouns these days, she said. It's just a part of introducing yourself. People even put it in their email signatures. Uh-huh. <laughs> but when was the last time anyone ever asked you for your pronouns? I asked my ultra-feminine, lipstick lesbian girlfriend. Lizzie didn't have an answer for that, of course, and God bless her, that's when she understood what I already did. In asking me to declare my pronouns, social justice warriors had discovered a whole new way to misgender me, to keep those doors to the club of womanhood closed. If I was 15 years old today, in 2021, as opposed to 15 years old in 1993, I think there's a very good chance I would declare myself trans and start the process of transitioning. At the very least, I'm sure I would tell the world I was non-binary or genderqueer, change my pronouns to he, him, or they, them, and announce these decisions via my Instagram bio. <laughs> After that, I would police my parents and peers and demand they use my newly adopted pronouns, giving them disdainful looks every time they use the old ones. And if I picked a new name, I'm sure it would be something hipster, like Liam, or Ian, <laughs> or Caden. <laughs> but fuck all that. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a teenager today. In the 90s, we used to say, who needs labels? Now, in the 2020s, we've sliced and diced male and female into a thousand and one fragments so that everyone gets their very own slice of the gender identity pie. Maybe the new labels feel like freedom and empowerment to some people. 
that's fine, and I totally get it. But I don't want you to slice my gender identity into something narrow and digestible, pushing me into the ever smaller confines of trans, non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid, masculine of center, masculine presenting, boy with an eye. <laughs> I don't want gender labels to get smaller. I just want woman to be big enough to include me. I don't want you to think it's sad that I grew up in an era when nobody told me I could change my name to Liam. I don't want you to think it's sad that my second grade teachers thought I needed counseling or that my mom forced me to grow my hair out or that people still chase me out of women's restrooms. Most of all, I don't want you to ask me for my preferred pronouns. I've finally come to realize that all these experiences are my womanhood. They are my womanhood and my femininity in a way that my uterus never was. Six weeks ago, I woke up in a green and white hospital gown with purple fleece socks on my feet and two ovaries still in my body. The ovaries were the only thing I really cared about because without them, I would instantly enter into menopause, which in turn would alter my hormones and my sex life forever. My oncologist can have my uterus, cervix, and fallopian tubes. Hell, she can bottle them up and use them for a paperweight for all I care. <laughs> It would be more use than I ever got out of them, but I didn't want her to touch my sex life because I never feel more like a woman than those moments when Lizzie looks at me and that suggestive smirk spreads across her face. That look in her eyes means I'm desired exactly as I am, and whether I wear a bra to bed or a strap on, I am already all the woman I ever needed to be. That is Bam Second Timer, Rachel Medlock. I met him in the theater. I don't remember the movie, but I've never forgotten him. We were both with Christian friends singing Christmas carols back and forth before the movie. Afterwards, we all went to someone's house and hung out. There was more singing, conversation, and prayers. There was something about him that drew me in. I tried not to be too obvious about my attraction as I glanced at him. I liked his clean cut looks his full lips that were most often parted in a smile, very kissable lips, and his generous, joyous presence. I hoped I wouldn't blush talking to him after the get-together. This was BC, before cell phones, and Facebook? FB founder Zuckerberg wasn't even a twinkle in his parents' eyes yet, but somehow we didn't manage to exchange numbers. Besides, he lived in a barracks on the nearby Air Force base, and I was an Air Force brat that spent several years on that base. I wasn't sure that I would ever want to get involved with a flyboy. Still, I thought about this guy for months afterwards. I wasn't sure that I would ever see him again, and I assumed that was that. Really, what did I think would happen anyway? His name was Don. I must have made an impression, though, because Don tracked me down through mutual friends. I want to move off base. Do you want to be housemates, he asked one day. Of course. I was living in a basement and sharing a bathroom with the family I rented from. So we rented a house, started attending the same church and hosting Bible studies. Was it domestic bliss? His calm presence helped still my turbulent waters. 
How he survived my moodiness, I don't know. I couldn't tell him what was at the root of my obsessions, moodiness, and even occasional self-harm. He's not a mind reader, and I have a wall around myself. The one or two times I tried to escape my prison in the past, it became quickly clear that it was not safe. Somehow, our shared faith helped mend the ups and downs in our relationship. When he asked me about what is most important to me, I always say, Jesus, of course, number two is my family. Number three, I lie. I always lie. I have to lie as I look into his brown puppy dog eyes because I want to blurt out you. Instead, I say, sharing God's love with the world. In my room with the fern wallpaper, I sing, how lovely are thy dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My fingers move lithely along my guitar Joshua's ebony neck, and he, as always, is responsive. Our bodies pressed close, Joshua's resonance becomes one with my voice. I feel in my breast one song of youthful yearning, unsated, hopeful, impossible. I'm really singing to my friend. Joshua's body is not the body I want pressed against mine. He is a beautiful, well-crafted instrument of seduction of God and man, but Joshua is only a guitar and cannot replace my need for relationship. I want to dwell in God, and I want God to dwell in me. Jesus loves me, this I know. What a friend we have in Jesus. My relationship with God is everything and yet nothing. At 21 years old, I want romance. Under my song, I'm trying to communicate this. Like a foreigner in a strange land, I long to be seen by you and to find favor in your sight. I want to be more than your housemate. I want your arms around me as your beloved, for you to hunger and thirst for me. Can you hear my invitation in your room next to mine? Be my soulmate. Be my dwelling place. Let me be your home. But how? After all, I am just a skinny Midwestern preacher boy, an ex-Catholic minor seminary dropout who loves Jesus, leading Bible studies, writing music, and my Christian housemate. I wouldn't use the word gay to describe myself, even though I don't think I've ever had any crushes that weren't men. I know my feelings are more complicated than that. I doubt that my church would need any other descriptor, any clarification of who I am than a sinner. So, mum's the word. I've got to keep myself under wraps. My identity, a secret so deep, I don't even want to acknowledge it to myself. Headline. Superman is Clark Kent. And <gasps> Clark Kent is really Lois Lane? I look more like skinny cub reporter Jimmy Olsen. My life has been an exhausting performance of maleness. I'm just a 21-year-old Jesus freak from the Midwest who maybe is a little naive around romance. I know that I've caught the eye of more than one older man, but sadly, none of my crushes have ever professed their undying love and sealed it with a kiss. Fear makes me hold Don away from my heart, lest my wall crack. Fear keeps me from telling him that I am not that person he drinks coffee with every morning. That is a mask, a persona, a social construct, a prison. Fear 
serves a purpose. It lets me pretend my heart is safe. But this kind of fear prevents me from being whole and it is slowly killing me. So I fantasize that he feels for me as I do for him, but that he's just as hesitant to proclaim it. I see every kindness as a sign of that love. Other times, I am sure his love is only of the brotherly kind, and I am thankful for such a kind and generous friend. Would my confession destroy that? Should I continue to silently long for him, even as I audibly yearn for the courts of the Lord? I want to be seen, but I am afraid to throw aside the mask. I, I want to be heard, but I am afraid to speak the truth. It seems an unsolvable dilemma. One thing I know, I will never tell him that when he works graveyard, I sit cross-legged on the floor wearing his uniform shirt. I bury my face in that shirt and breathe deep. It smells of him, young and virile, and that soothes, but also makes raw my feelings of barrenness and flesh and soul. His shirt wrapped tightly around me in place of his arms is a mere band-aid, not the balm I need. It is only a shirt and not the man who wears it. And where is God in all of this? AWOL? Indifferent? I weep. I take Joshua in my arms and pour out my invocation in a minor key. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Where are my promised good things? What is wrong with me? It is so unfair. How can I walk uprightly when I stagger, shackled by a conspiracy of one? I send forth enchantment. Let me be your dwelling place, God. Please let me be your dwelling place, my friend, and your heart's home. There is no answer except the one I have always known. There is no magical way out of my life and what I am. No clicking of ruby slippers or rubbing of a lamp or walking through a wardrobe door or divine intervention. I want what I want. But there was never any way but this. The truth will set you free. I shake my head no. I am not ready, I scream at the walls. My incantation dies, broken amidst the ferns, the song of a lark cut short by window glass. From wallpaper, fern leaves curl and russet fall. Ashes. The flotsam becomes one with salty rivers in this wasteland. I lay the guitar and psalm in the ruins. As I fall asleep in his oversized shirt, I dream of green love unfurling. It will have to be enough for now. I am 21 and not yet the woman I will become. Everyone assumes I'm a dyke. Some butch bitch trying to steal your girlfriend. I don't fucking care about your girlfriend. I just came here to buy some groceries. I never understood how people who've never met you could make such bold statements about someone's sexual identity. Does it matter? Why did that man call you sir? My mother says, borderline outraged. I'm 12. We're at Mervyn's buying a shirt. I have no idea. I mumble, embarrassed. This is not the last time I'll get called sir. Little did I know I'd be called sir hundreds more times from then on.
and easily ten times more often than ever being called ma'am. You'd think the ponytail and double D's I was rocking would be a clear indicator that I am not a man. But here we are, twelve years old in Mervyn's, with an irritated mother, who clearly assumes I came in early that day and requested this guy call me sir at checkout. Obviously, I plotted this. For years, women in my life have wanted to dress me up, slathering makeup on my face while curling my hair. They talk about the clothes they own that I simply must try on after getting these unwanted makeovers. When I wasn't locked into an eyelash curler, or as I like to call it, guillotine, my mother would constantly try to show my body off to her friends. Look at her. Do you see this body? My aunts and grandmother constantly pushing the hair behind my ears, saying things like, You'd be so much prettier if only you... I'd be prettier if. If. If I only look completely different, apparently. The truth is, I've always felt like my body was betraying me. Going through puberty, having grown men honk, whistle, or even follow me for blocks until I was in a more populated area became the norm. What a shitty thing to endure because my body simply exists. I certainly didn't ask for it. Here comes puberty, highlighting all those curves, drawing attention, causing trouble. I started covering up the summer after sixth grade. I would borrow clothes from my stepdad after he'd left for work. Nothing too fitted, nothing exposing too much skin, hiding all the parts that were most likely to get noticed. Sagging your pants became increasingly popular and gave me an opportunity to protect the one thing that had already been violated. I was molested at age four and over-sexualized by my mother and her mother and countless others for years. Kids at school would make fun of me for my baggy clothes, asking why a girl would sag if she didn't have a dick. <laughs> the irony. After my sophomore year in high school, I cut my hair short, a bob. My mother was devastated and spent 15 minutes crying over the bathroom trash can full of my former locks. How could you do this? Your hair was so beautiful. Not me. My hair. Again, something else needed in order to aid in all the attractiveness I was clearly lacking. As I moved through puberty, my hair got shorter, my mo clothes more masculine, my voice deeper, much deeper. My second year in the school chorus, I was moved from the alto section to tenor. Me and five guys. Awesome. All this and my newfound voice only supported the sirs. Needless to say, mom wasn't thrilled. The way I choose to dress, predominantly menswear, has little to do with how I identify myself. I don't present myself as masculine because I want to be a man. I do it because there's a sense of security, safety in it. Having been sexualized and tormented by my ever-changing body, I did my best to keep covered up. I've had towels and blankets pried out of my hand so my mom could show me off at pool parties and sleepovers. My body became not only a place of severe shame, but something that needed defending. Assuming I'm a lesbian based on how I dress is your choice. I'm not worried about your opinion of me or who I choose to sleep with. And yes, I have slept with a man once. It was not a great experience. He was my intermittent boyfriend from sixth grade to 10th. He asked me to ditch class one day to hang out. His parents weren't home. No one was. As soon as we got inside, he asked if I wanted to watch porn pass. Then he asked if I wanted to see his room. Sure, why not? We started kissing, and he started to remove some of my clothes, as well as his own, asking if he could try this or that, all of which I denied. So he asked me to get in the shower with him. Not much better. The designated ditch zone, second period and nutrition break, was closing. So we gathered ourselves and went back to school. The walk back was quiet and awkward and we didn't talk for the rest of the day. Later that week, he broke up with me, saying he only wanted me to go to his house so he could practice having sex with me because there was another girl that he liked. Nothing boosts a girl's confidence more than being used for a practice session of sex so that he could feel more confident with someone else. He really solidified my need to distance myself from men for a while. 15 years later, some friends and I went to a club downtown. We were having a great time drinking and dancing as a group until I got tapped on the shoulder. A fairly handsome guy asked if he could dance with me. 
He said that he'd been watching me dance with my friends, and he knew he just had to dance with me. It had been a while since I'd been close to a guy physically. Maybe this could be a good way to reintroduce the idea. Reluctantly, I agreed. Maybe two minutes into dancing, he takes my hand. I think, this is weird. And I let him, just to see where he thinks we're going. He places my hand on his dick. No joke. His hand over mine, holding it in place. Is this supposed to impress me? Is this how people get picked up at bars now? What the actual fuck? I pull my hand away and leave the dance floor, finding my friends and keeping my distance from this fucking creep. Who does that? Hey man, I'll be with you in a moment. I'm at our local bike shop, browsing accessories and waiting for someone to be available. When I turn around, the employee, a man, looks affronted and muddles through a half-assed apology about misgendering me. He doesn't mean it, and it wouldn't have mattered if he did. I'm almost 40. I could give a shit about what you think I have going on in my nether regions. Do you have the bike part I need or not? He obviously isn't the first to assume I'm a dude, man, bro, or sir. He won't be the last. He's clearly offended by my appearance, or what seems to be, my very distinct breasts on my masculine presenting body. I'm sorry me not being a man is causing you such inner turmoil, I guess. We had a transgender gentleman on staff for a while. When he was going through transition, we made sure to let the other staff know he'd be using his gender preferred bathroom. A week later, I got approached by another employee. I thought for sure they were going to take issue with the, our team member using the men's room. Instead, I was asked when I would be doing mine. My what? You know, you dress like this, so I just figured you would be transitioning too. First of all, that's incredibly presumptuous. It's funny, the looks I've gotten. I've had people leave aisles in the grocery store because of how I look. People have crossed the street to avoid getting too close, like my sexuality or presentation are contagious. Then again, I've been hit on by men while dressed in a suit and tie. I like your uniform. You look really hot. Um, right. My uniform. These are my clothes, but thanks. Not now, not ever, have I ever wanted to be a man. At least not in the sense of sexuality. Sure, it'd be nice to garner equal pay, social statuses, and general basic respect. But it shouldn't matter what is or isn't dangling between my legs. My attire is me exerting a boundary, putting up my Jurassic Park-style fencing. Let go, Tim. If you've never been accosted, accused, or condemned based solely on your appearance, consider yourself lucky. While my hair has gotten shorter and the majority of my relationships have resided on the gayer end of the rainbow, I will remain wholly female. It doesn't mean I'm counting dudes out. I check guys out. I've thought about sleeping with them. I'm not opposed to the idea, just incredibly reserved about it. I've stopped correcting people who call me sir, guy, fella, or man. It doesn't matter. If you need to label me to feel better about your construct of how the world works, then so be it. I will not justify my appearance to anyone. So go ahead, whisper behind my back. It's not going to change anything. Tell me I'm handsome. Sure, call me a dyke. And let's be honest, your girlfriend was hitting on me. So much emotional vulnerability. I hope you're deeply uncomfortable after 16 months of basically being able to just say nasty, horrible things to people on the internet with no consequences. And now you feel the consequences enveloped on our stage. Uh, we're just going to get right into the second half. Welcome to the stage of Vamp First Timer, somebody I have been privileged to work with a long time ago and always wanted her to do this show, my friend, Rachel Holt. I never had a television in my home growing up. I was required to wear skirts below my knees, never pants. No makeup, no booty, beauty accoutrement or other feminine things that were considered sexually provocative in 
anyway. My mother was in the Marine Corps when she met and married my father. At that time, as a woman in the Marines, you were supposed to ask permission to get pregnant. She was kicked out of the Marines once she was found to be pregnant with my older sister. And shortly thereafter, my father was put in prison for a laundry list of offenses, including assaulting a superior officer with a knife. He was in and out of prison just long enough to further impregnate my mother with me and my younger brother. With dad in the joint, it was up to my mother and her limited life skills to raise the three of us. Because my father's state-funded hotel stays were close to Denver, Colorado, my mother settled in Colorado Springs. If you know anything about this town, its most shimmering traits are the view of Pikes Peak, a large population of military folks, and its tendencies towards right-leaning religious movements. This proximity to the burgeoning conservative movements is how the religious cult that we were a part of became of such importance to her. The structure of a built-in community gave her a sense of security while raising us by herself. In this particular Kool-Aid of religion, outside contact by way of newspapers, magazines, books, radio, or any form of media was condemned. Contact with non-believers was also not allowed unless permission was granted, including immediate family members if they were not in the cult. While women's bodies were the most policed of all, the men and boys still had standards to follow, although time and time again, it was abundantly clear that there was a double standard. The ideology of this particular ilk can best be described as a conglomeration between Amish, Pentecostal, and strict Mormon. No dating was allowed until after age 18, and then was strictly regulated by an approval process and thereafter chaperoned by a deacon of the church until marriage. Virginity and purity were overvalued and in traditional Old Testament style, large families were encouraged. These are just a few of the gems that this cult boasted. I was sexually abused by the pastor's adult son from the ages of 12 to 13. I told no one until I was 19 and then it was just to my sister in hopes that telling someone else it would alleviate the burden of carrying it alone. My sister freaked out. And although I pleaded with her not to, went directly to my mother with the information. My mother went straight to the pastor who vehemently denied any knowledge of the situation and basically accused her of lying. Wednesday night of that same week, he preached her out of the church. This meant without calling her out by name, that he yelled and screamed from the pulpit about lying, spreading rumors, and degrading her character to the point that she was crying. She was devastated at the prospect of losing her church family of so many years, but after this event decided it was best she leave. Even before all of this came out, I had decided I had to leave the cult. I was 19, and once I was out of my mother's house, I had come to the realization that the lifestyle I had been raised in was a sham. I realized that leaving would have to be decisive, clean, and diabolical. <laughs> In building up my courage to do so, I thought that if I just did enough of the bad things, like not showing up for church gatherings, that it would help, and began doing these in earnest. I skipped church on Sunday, Wednesday, and visitation on Thursday evenings. I didn't participate in the bus routes on Saturday or Sunday, and I didn't even give in a hint of an excuse about why I wasn't going. I stopped singing in the choir. When the youth pastor and his wife reached out to me about my absence, I carelessly ignored their phone messages. I realized I would have to make a leap of sorts and sever ties completely. I did so, albeit dramatically, by applying for and taking a job at America's Beach Club in Colorado Springs as a beer bucket girl. <laughs> this was a beach theme bar, also known as a military dude's cheap strip club, and I was called by the manager to take a shift that first evening. I suddenly realized that I was quite unprepared for the uniform. <laughs> 
it wasn't the fact that I didn't have a bikini. That fact is almost inconsequential here. <laughs> it's more important that this was the first bikini that I were ever worn and that wearing one, especially in public view, was considered a transgression worthy of hellfire <laughs> by the cult. In my society, women who wear bikinis were harlots, Jezebel's women of ill repute. <laughs> the women of the Old Testament that caused all of the trouble upon which our society now rests. <laughs> the fact that I rebelled against all of my indoctrinated teachings and ran to Walmart after my sh first shift at the eight to five job I held as a receptionist to buy my first bikini was both exciting and nerve wracking. I had never owned a bikini in my life. I vividly remember walking into the local Walmart just a few minutes from my office job, but in a neighborhood where I knew some of the folks from the cult lived. Coming from work, I had only a few minutes to decide what kind, style, cut, and color of bikini I wanted. I was in a hurry to get in and out of the store without being seen. The pit of my stomach was dry and bubbly at the same time. My eyes darted around in search of someone from the cult who may suddenly catch me doing this devious deed and tell on me. Had someone spotted me in the swimwear section, I would have been in serious trouble. I remember being too nervous and scared to even try it on, but rather grabbed two suits of completely different cuts and styles and shot to the checkout like a rocket only to dash to my car for safety. I remember coming home from the store and hurriedly getting ready. The shift started at 10 p.m., but I was supposed to report there early to interview and fill out paperwork with the manager. Showing even my shoulders, upper arms, anything below my neck or above my knees was something I had never done in public, yet here I was, putting on my first bikini and waltzing not only into the outside world, but into a bar. <laughs> in some sense, I knew that it would be okay, since I had a strong realization that nobody I knew would be there. And that was comforting. At the ripe age of 19, I had never even been inside of a bar, and I had no idea what to expect. That night was a night I'll never forget. At that point, I had never had an alcohol a drink, never seen a movie, never seen or been inside of a club, never experienced any kind of nightlife whatsoever. When I walked into the club, it was dark and smelly. The hazy, damp interior of the club was overwhelming, and it took a few minutes for my eyes and senses to adjust. I smelled rotten vinegar and cleaning solution at the same time, not realizing that this was probably vomit or beer being mopped up off the floor from the night before. Light pop music was playing in the background and there were a few people scattered at the main bar. A few voices came at me from all different directions from inside of this cavernous dark space, shouting back and forth at each other in indiscernible words I couldn't quite catch. I walked up to the front desk in my mind, which was really just the bouncer check-in point that you go to, and I asked for the bar manager. Someone at the counter pointed me towards a back room, and I entered a small, dingy, dark, dark office. Sitting bes behind a smallish desk was a wired manager by the name of Chuck, who seemed startled at first, then in a quick-paced voice gave me the basics of the job requirements. He inspected me, quite honestly, very physically, including asking me to stand up, turn around several times, and bend over front and back. After the visual inspection, he told me where to put my things, quickly explained how to handle the till in my tip jar. I didn't have one. Told me that we would have a crew meeting at 9.30, at which time we would all do a shot together, and that I would be working in the club until it closed at 2 a.m., one of the other beer bucket girls introduced me to the others, the bartenders, the barbacks, security guards, and the DJ. The security guards were all members of the United States Olympic judo team and were perpetually on high alert to put their skills to practice at the slightest hint of a scuffle. <laughs> As we walked through the two rooms of the main club, she excitedly told me that she had just had her hood pierced that day and was completely turned on every time she took a step. <laughs> I pretended to know what she was talking about. 
and rattled off a few mumbled words of admiration. <laughs> At every hour on the hour, the entire bar staff was required to move to a visible, elevated spot in the club and dance to the song, Car Wash. <laughs> the same girl who had had her he hood pierced earlier that day had hur hurriedly taught me the movements and I awkwardly stumbled through them as best I could. The cash register at my beer well was old, rickety, and covered in a sticky substance I couldn't identify. Never ha having handled cash in a setting like this before, the first few transactions took me a lot longer than they should have, and the manager began to notice. He walked by and yelled at me to move faster and smile more, and being a good Christian girl, <laughs> I complied. The long line of young GIs at my beer well were much more kind, some of which began pulling out exact change and leaving double the cost of their cheap beer in my tip jar. That first evening when my beer bucket till came up $2 short, Chuck berated me. He seemed overly agitated over the measly $2. I was on cloud nine. Not only had I made out with over $200 in tips, but I had danced in public, been in a bar, wore my first bikini ever in public, and sold beer to admiring drunk men. The experience of having all of these firsts happen in one night was a rebirth. It was an immersive rebellion from all the indoctrination I had experienced and a massy, massive belly flop into the pool of the opposite direction. It was exactly what I needed. Everything I'd been top up until that point screamed at me that this was exactly where I shouldn't be, while at the same time I felt it's precisely where I wanted to be. There was a transgression happening in my mind and body that was so delightful yet so daring and aggressive that I was both terrified and exhilarated at the same time. It felt as though I had a massive weight lifted off and that anything I'd ever thought about doing before was now possible. The extreme measures I had taken to get to that first of evenings seemed appropriate. I had finally found my break. Not only was it a welcoming, albeit different culture of folks, roughly similar in age, but it also fostered fast friendships, some of which I still have today. That first bikini is one uniform that I'll never regret wearing. In hindsight, wearing that first bikini made me realize that the risk you t choose to take, no matter how overwhelming or intimidating it may be, is well worth the risk, regret of the risk not taken. In terms of dress, I now prefer to think that less is more. First timer at BAMP, Rachel Holt. I don't like asking for help. I need it sometimes, just as we all do. But asking for it, that's a struggle. I turn into a seven-year-old that doesn't want to take a bath. I'll stamp my feet around the apartment for as long as I possibly can until I realize no one hears my screams. I'm just going to have to suck it up and ask for help, or at least bathe myself. <laughs> I've always been this way, too. Well, not always. It's 1987, and I'm going to a dance put on by the Jewish youth group I'm part of. My date. Cheryl. I don't remember her last name, but I do remember her hair was brown and wavy and was long enough to barely touch her shoulders. I also remember things were definitely happening at that weird age of 12, and I had a hell of a crush on Cheryl. <laughs> Cheryl's family was well off financially. They didn't live in a mansion or own a big chunk of land, but their large house and multiple cars were a good bit different than my own living situation. My small family lived in a two-bedroom apartment where I shared a room with my brother, and we had one car that my single parent mother used for her three jobs. Just a year earlier, fresh off a bitter divorce after an emotionally and physically abusive 17 year marriage, my mother sold the house and almost everything in it, packed up the car with the two kids and whatever else would fit in there, then drove cross country from Northern California to Baltimore, back home, back to family that would unfortunately splinter even more with my grandma Rose's death in 1989. 
Cheryl had a family dynamic I didn't really understand and also didn't realize I craved. Every time I went to her house, both parents were there. The fridge and pantries were stocked, and they actually had time to talk to me. This is when they found out I didn't have a suit to wear to the dance and that we probably couldn't afford a new one. Well, I'm sure we can help with that, they said. I never took that as a slight in any way. In fact, it was by far the nicest thing someone had done for me up to that point. I was going to the dance with Cheryl, and I was going to look nice. Now, at the time, in the mid-'80s, pleated pants and pastel suit jackets that hung down past your backside were in style. Tie and belt were optional. Think Uncle Jesse in Full House <laughs> mixed with Sonny Crockett in Miami Vice. <laughs> Hip and fun, but edgy and well-dressed, you know what every 12-year-old aspires to be. But more than how good I was going to look, their offer made me feel a little hopeful and not really so worried about how I was going to look. Cheryl's parents were going to do that for me, so suit shopping we went. I returned home later that day with a brand spanking new suit in hand. I pulled it out of its cover and beamed with excitement as I showed my mother and told her where it came from. I could still smell the department store on it, a, a mix of cologne and stale fabric. I could also see, though, my mother wasn't nearly as excited as I was. When my mother gets mad, her lips and eyes get very thin, and the speed at which these two things happened when I showed her the suit was surprising. We do not take charity, she said. If you need a suit, you tell me and we'll figure something out. But deep down, I knew. I knew we wouldn't be able to afford the one we got, the one I really wanted, the one that made me look, look not only hip like Uncle Jesse, but feel edgy like Crockett. It was how I felt when I tried it on in the store for the first time, and now I'll never get Cheryl to confirm that. The next day, my mother took me to Cheryl's house to thank them for the offer, but explained that I couldn't accept their gift. Cheryl was confused, but the concerned look on her parents' face made it seem like they understood. And I crawled back to the car, feeling smaller than the dirt underneath my shoes. I was too ashamed and angry to want to understand. Growing up in a military household and moving every few years, it made it really tough to make and keep friends. My patience at this point was thin when it came to things being taken away from me. It took a few decades to really understand why my mother reacted this way, and it turns out it had nothing to do with me at all. And it really started when my mother was a kid on the streets of Baltimore. Frida's a baby boomer, the youngest of six, three boys and three girls, a mishmash of children from various marriages. Her father, Grandpa Aaron, was a cab driver in the city of Baltimore. And raising a family with six kids in the 50s on a cabbie's income was nearly impossible. They made it work, but because of it, they didn't have the fancy car or the nice clothes. Sometimes my grandma Rose made my mother hand-sewn dresses on an old-fashioned foot treadle singer sewing machine. This handmade outfit is something I'm all too familiar with myself. Stop it. I hate that picture. My mother wasn't included in a lot of the things the rest of her siblings were up to due to the age differences between them. So most of the time, Frida spent her time with a few friends in their Park Heights neighborhood in Baltimore. But she also faced vicious bullying and from an unexpected group of kids she thought was her own. Up the street from their home was a school for ultra-Orthodox Jewish boys, the Talmudical Academy. My mother, however, was not their idea of Jewish. To them, my mother, my mother was one of the poor Jews, and it showed in how she dressed. Their fathers weren't blue-collar Jewish like Grandpa Aaron. They had the luxury of wearing the crisp white shirts and pressed black pants, finished off with a black yarmulke and the payas, the side curls that Jewish boys, not yet bar mitzvahed, were required to have. But to my mother, they just looked like little mean old men. And mean they were. <laughs> my mother was called names, taunted, spit on, simply because she wasn't rich and Jewish enough. The impact this had on my mother uh, was significant enough that it would carry on for decades and play an important role in how she raised me and my brother. When I was 17 years dumb, I stole a car with some friends and drove from Maryland to Georgia. <laughs> the day we arrived, we were arrested and somehow released back into society. But instead of, asking, but instead of me asking for help in getting back home to Maryland, I decided to look for work. I guess this is my home now, was my thought. After a week or so of just not getting any interest in the pizza joints I applied to, I decided maybe I should just go home. Now, we heard and stupidly believed that if you told someone at the Greyhound station that you were a runaway, they would put you on a bus home for free. <laughs> Instead, they called the cops. <laughs> the other people I was with were able to identify themselves, but without ID, I had some trouble. And eventually, I was just taken to Juvenile Hall in downtown Atlanta. I was given one last phone call, 
And this time I was able to reach my brother, but at the time our relationship was in tatters. Why should I tell them I know you, he asked. In hindsight, he was right to ask that question. I needed that wake-up call, but at the time, all it did was solidify what we were being taught by our mother. Don't ask for help, do it yourself. And the fact that we asked Greyhound for help and they called the fuzz on us was even further proof in my mind. But back to 1987, because I still went to that dance with Cheryl, though now feeling much more like a crumpled $10 bill than a million bucks. Didn't matter, though, at least not to her. During one of the slow songs towards the end of the night, with my hands nervously on her hips and her hands on my shoulders, we met eyes and awkwardly smiled, and she quickly leaned in and kissed me. That million-dollar feeling was there when I left the dance. Take that, Uncle Jesse. Who needs you, Crockett? <laughs> A few months after the dance, I started at a new school and my path in life went a different way. Cheryl and I wrote letters and called a handful of times. She even sent me her freshman year high school photo, but we eventually lost contact. My mother doesn't remember this incident of uh, making me return the suit, but we're both not surprised. At the time, she was working uh, three jobs, just trying to make sure her two bickering teenage children didn't go homeless and hungry. Compared to the other tragedies and hardships we endured during those years, this was a minor blip to her. I asked her if she'd do the same thing if she had to do it all over again. She was silent for a moment, then said, yeah, I would. I realized now my mother's pride took a hit the day I came home with that suit. In her mind, the rich Jews buying the poor Jews things was just as demeaning as the bullying. Not only did she think she wasn't doing her job as a mother, I'm sure she could also hear the taunting of those Jewish boys again, maybe even feel the spit hitting her feet or legs or arms, just like it did 30 years prior. I love my mom, even a rough past that shaped her into the mother she is. A one-time radio DJ, I gotta say, she's pretty cool. And overall, she did an amazing job as a, as a single mother. My brother's a well-respected lawyer, a member of the Baltimore City community, and I'm, well, not in jail. <laughs> My mother says there's two types of kids, one that grows up to be a lawyer and one that grows up to need a lawyer. <laughs> and my mother's lucky enough to have both. <laughs> but to me, this one moment in time, the time my mother's bullied history and ingrained pride overrode realizing the message her actions were sending, it mattered and still does. At the time, it was painfully embarrassing and today it explains so much, like how perhaps many of my struggles wouldn't have had the impact they had if I could have just brought myself to ask for help. I'm 46 years old, and I still struggle sometimes between knowing the difference between charity and help. During the pandemic, I was one of the unfortunate many that lost work. It took me three and a half months to apply for unemployment benefits. It wasn't shame that prevented me from doing it. I just couldn't bring myself to accept that I earned that money, at least not in the way I was used to. Still, it was a stack of money meant for times like this, <laughs> and I couldn't even bring myself to ask for something that was rightfully mine. And when I finally did, in my head was the replay of the day I brought home the suit. And just talking about it now, I can hear my mother say, we don't take charity, through her lips thin with stung pride. And I can feel how it felt walking back to the car after returning it to Cheryl and her family. All the blood in my body seemingly right under that first layer of skin. And there it is that god-awful itch of the worn-out Cliff Huxtable sweater I was forced to wear to the dance with Cheryl. Yeah, welcome him to VAMP for his first time. That is Adam Greenfield. It's the night before my twin sister, Kayla's wedding. We're walking back to the hotel from dinner down the brightly lit streets of downtown Chicago. Warmth and laughter spill onto the sidewalks from the pubs and pizzerias we pass, but the May evening has an unseasonable chill, just as a, our dinner had an air of disappointment. While my mom and her partner, Keith, had joined me, my twin sister, and my future brother-in-law at the restaurant, my dad and my stepmom had not. It had been a long-running half-joke between my twin sister and I that whoever got married first was screwed, because whoever it was would have to navigate bringing our parents together for the first time since their divorce when we were 16. As it turned out, 
Kayla was the one to receive this dubious honor, which very, very briefly made me feel lucky to still be single at 33. And now here we were, anxiously awaiting the following day, when our parents would be in the same room together for the first time in 15 years. Our parents' divorce had been ugly. Ugly in ways that many divorces are and ugly in ways specific to our family. There was history between my mom, dad, and stepmom. They had all worked together in the early 80s. My stepmom and dad had been friends and then after my mom was hired, my mom and dad started dating and eventually married. My dad and stepmom went their separate ways, but at some point during my parents' marriage, they reconnected. And well, that was the beginning of the messy, painful end of the life I had known. While my sister and I had recognized that our parents' marriage didn't seem to have much love in it, we told our friends at sleepovers that our parents were more like roommates. Neither of us suspected they would ever get a divorce. But they did, and the divorce left my mom devastated. She had done so much for our family, including giving up her career to care for us when we were young, then being the sole breadwinner so that we could scrape by when my dad was unemployed for several long periods. After all she had done during their 20-year marriage, this final betrayal was too much. The first year after my dad moved out, my mom stayed confined to the darkness of her bedroom, leaving Kayla and I to finish out our final year of high school largely on our own. Eventually, time and medication helped pull her out of the dark place in which she'd fallen, but the collateral damage had impacted us all. My sister and I were both incredibly hurt and angry at our dad and resentful towards our stepmom for their roles in the disastrous ending of our family as we knew it. With our home life in chaos, my sister and I exerted control over the only thing we could, food and exercise. And by that I mean too much exercise and too little food. And we both lost a lot of weight. Fortunately for us, our restrictive diets and compulsive workouts began to resolve once we moved out of the house, but for my mom, there was no easy fix. Struggling and finding herself alone for the first time in 20 years with Kayla and I away at college, my mom was an island. Meanwhile, 11 months after my parents' divorce was finalized, my dad and stepmom were married on a cruise ship. Now it was my sister's turn to get married. Since announcing her engagement, Kayla and I had been strategizing about how to bring everyone together, especially because our parents would be sitting together at the reception. This was for two reasons. First, only a table's worth of our small family was attending the wedding, and it seemed unfair to seat our mom with strangers. Second, Kayla and I had spent our entire adult lives accommodating our parents' discomfort. We'd had enough. We'd earned a reprieve, and this weekend was it. We decided it would be best if we invited them for dinner the night before the wedding. Our hope was to ensure that our parents' first encounter, which would be awkward at best, disastrous at worst, could take place in private instead of in front of 200 strangers at the wedding. When we asked our mom about the idea, she was fine with it, as she'd moved on with her life years before and was in a happy long-term relationship with Keith, who I really like because he's thoughtful, caring, and treats her the way she deserves to be treated. However, our dad and stepmom declined the dinner invitation, saying they'd already made plans with friends. This did not come as much of a surprise. Our dad had already sent a series of emails expressing his concern about my mom sitting with them at the rece reception, using phrases like, it would be extremely awkward for everyone and your mom would probably find it challenging. All of us had been trying to control the situation in different ways, but in the end, we all failed. My sister kept the seating arrangement as it was, 
and my dad and stepmom kept their dinner plans with their friends. As the five of us who did go to dinner near the hotel, I can't help but feel a pit in my stomach. I want so much for this weekend to be about Kayla and her fiance, but there is a heavy sense of dread hanging over our heads. We're heading toward the brightly lit hotel lobby when I notice another group also approaching the sliding glass doors. When the group crosses the valet driveway and steps into the light, I realize, oh shit, it's my dad, my stepmom, my aunt, several of my dad's friends. We are on a collision course <laughs> to enter the lobby at the exact same moment. The moment my sister and I had failed to orchestrate but that the universe had decided was going to happen nonetheless. As the first one to realize this, I'm not sure whether to sound an alarm or laugh at the irony. I mean, really, what are the odds that both groups are returning to the hotel from separate dinners at different restaurants in opposite directions at the exact same moment? I'm quickly sucked into a whirl of chaos and surprise, a jumble of startled hellos and how are yous as we spill into the lobby together. My aunt, who had often asked after my mom at Christmas dinners, is the first to cross the imaginary boundary between the two sides of our family, embracing my mom warmly after so many years apart. Everyone politely makes the rounds greeting one another, including my parents, then settle into smaller, more comfortable cliques of conversation. Soon enough, though, the small talk wears thin, as it always does, and people begin to excuse themselves to their rooms. I can feel the opportunity to make more of this moment slipping through my fingers, as it's only a matter of time before my parents do the same. After conferring with my sister, I approach my mom and ask her if she and Keith would be willing to grab a drink with us, and that I'm planning to invite my dad and stepmom too. My mom looks at Keith, then back at me. Sure, honey, whatever you guys want. Next, I go over to my dad and ask the same thing, though I'm considerably less sure of what his answer will be. My dad looks around the hotel lobby as if assessing where the nearest emergency exit is, then replies, well, we need to run upstairs, um, but if you tell us where you're going, we can meet you there. It isn't exactly the answer I'm hoping for, as they still might not show, but for now, it's good enough. We end up at an Irish pub down the street, <laughs> and I panic the moment we walk in. The place is packed with 20-somethings and extremely noisy. Not exactly ideal circumstances for a tense family reunion. And I doubt we're going to find a table for seven. But sure enough, a resourceful hostess finds us a large booth in the back that is out of the fray. I slide in on one side, followed by my mom and Keith, and my sister and her fiance slide in on the other. We order a round of drinks to help steel ourselves for what's to come. My dad and stepmom arrive shortly after, sliding into the booth next to my sister. Everyone seems ill at ease, to say the least, but my dad is a good talker who always has a story ready, and the presence of two people not involved in our family drama make Keith and my sister's fiance ideal targets for easy conversation. Sipping a glass of Cabernet as polite, though somewhat forced exchanges swirl around me, I am able to finally appreciate the magnitude of the moment. Here are my parents together at the same table with me and my sister for the first time in 15 years. Despite all that has transpired among us for more than a decade, we are a family once again. I'm the fifth wheel of the group and desperate to share this moment with someone. Under the table, I fire off a text to my boyfriend 2,000 miles away in Tucson. OMG, my parents and Kayla and I are all at a bar together right now. It is unreal. After an hour or so, we decide to call it a night and head back to the hotel. 
I walk ahead alone, still basking in a moment I know I will cherish for the rest of my life. At the wedding the next day, the thaw that had started the night before continues to melt the rifts that have separated my family for so long. Among the many sights at the reception are my dad and stepmom hanging out with Keith at the bar, my aunt and mom fondly reminiscing about the days when Kayla and I were little, and my mom and stepmom dancing side by side on the dance floor together, heads thrown back in laughter. At the end of the wedding, as everyone is preparing to leave, I see my mom and dad hug each other for the first time since I was seven years old. It feels like a new chapter is starting for all of us. I am already fantasizing about all of us having Thanksgiving together instead of Kayla and I driving between houses for separate meals. Maybe we really could put the past behind us. I'd like to say that everything changed for our family after that weekend, but it didn't. My parents returned to their separate lives, and in the three years that have since passed, they have not talked to or seen each other again. But in the end, that doesn't really matter. For one weekend, full of perfect, unimaginable moments, we were a family again. And that is enough to last me a lifetime, or at the very least, until it's my turn to get married. <laughs> Vam, first timer, Janelle Drumright. How was the show, everybody? Yeah. I think I almost broke this. Okay. Can you guys do me a huge favor? Can you guys help me cheer on all the wonderful fucking performers we had tonight? We had Savannah Cannon, Arthur Song, Rachel Medlock, Rachel Holt. Adam Greenfield and Janelle Drumright. Woo! I just realized I'm a woo girl. I just I, <laughs> woo! All right. Also, can we please, please give a round of applause for the volunteers we had tonight? We had Brent Hanafy, Jennifer Coburn, Reed Anula, Annalise Scoops, Jonathan Hammond, Killian Whitelock, and Tom Hoffman. Thank you, everyone. And here's a thanks to Jennifer and Justin for keeping So Say We All alive. You guys have encouraged tons of people to tell their stories, and you guys make a big difference. And I'm so thankful for you, as well as everyone else here. So thankful for you guys. You guys do so much hard work. Love you, Lots of love. Love you, Justin. Love you, Jennifer. If you have any questions or you guys want to know more, go to so say we all online.com. It was so nice seeing you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you, We're here. Thank you guys so much. Drive safe. <laughs>